Do you believe in miracles part two? That's what we're doing today on the Embryo Adoption Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Mellinger, and joining me are Perry and Sydney Walden. Every embryo adoption birth that we facilitate at the NEDC is a miracle. Really, every birth period is a miracle. Their story even more so. So we're going to dive into that today. If you want more information on the NEDC, go to embryodonation.org. Again, that's embryodonation.org. Man, it's so good to have you two here now. We had you on um, not all that long ago. I guess it's probably, I don't know, what, year and a half, something like that ago. You were pregnant at the time. Uh, the story has played out since then. And such a such a cool story. Let's start by retracing your steps. You were told, Sydney, to stop your medication after your embryo transfer with the NEDC, right? Yes. The numbers we I can't even remember how many betas we I guess we did three before we were told to stop. Um the numbers were not increasing. So the first time there was no increase, the second time there was a slight increase. Um, but for where, you know, how far along I was supposed to be, my numbers were very low and not showing any sign of a healthy pregnancy. And you were told, okay, stop, stop taking your medications. Something inside you for people who haven't heard the story said, I don't think that's right. Walk me through that. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't even think I had that gut feeling at first, like I stopped the meds. I mean, you know, that's, we very much trust the NEDC. We still do. And we knew that they preserve life as long as possible. And so um, when they said to stop the meds, we did. And that was our second transfer. The first one had it resulted in a chemical pregnancy. And so now we were staring down the, oh, like the end of another transfer with another loss. And it was just devastating. I just didn't know where to go from there. Um, and so I think we really just needed to like escape for a, for a second, <laughs> like a minute, take a minute. Um, and so two days after that, we went on a hike. We just like took the afternoon off of work, went on like a little mile hike up the mountain and stopped. And, you know, I think we both kind of looked at everything and you had even said, you're like, I don't understand how God can create like such beautiful things. And we just feel like we're not getting any of that. And I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't know either. Um, but we felt some sort of peace there on the mountain where God met us. And when we came down, I asked Perry to stop and get another pregnancy test on the way home. And he was like, why would you be doing that to yourself? Um, and I said, I just, I want to know that they're gone. Like, I want to know that I've lost them. I want it to be like conclusive. And so it was not negative, <laughs> very positive the next day. Um, which resulted in a panic call to Linda back at the NEDC and several more betas. Um, and oh, I mean, I'm like really shortening the version here. A lot of anxiety, a lot of, um, I don't fear, a lot of unknowns, I think, for yeah, the next week. You know, like, you know, is, is it a healthy pregnancy? Is yeah, it not a healthy pregnancy? Yeah. yeah, you know, and I was kind of like begging to go back on my meds because my numbers were not indicating that anything about this was going to be healthy. But I just felt like, if whoever, whatever was inside of me was not done fighting, I was not done fighting. Um, and so the fact that my numbers never dropped, they kept going up just much slower than what would indicate a normal pregnancy. And it was right when I was six weeks. I think we finally, yeah, finally had an ultrasound because Dr. Keenan's like, we need to know what's going on. Like at this, like, <laughs> yeah, we're done. Yeah, we're done with the blood draws. Like we need to be able to see what's going on. Um, and there was, one little baby there with a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and that baby is now your daughter. We're going to talk about this. But I want to ask you, when you have spoken about this with Dr. Keenan, I'm interested in a window into what that conversation is like, because as, as you said, obviously, we're extremely pro-life. Uh, our folks who are connected with the NEDC would never encourage anybody to stop doing anything that we believe would facilitate a pregnancy and facilitate life. As long as there is a chance, uh, you know, they're, they're going to, they're going to be all for that. 
it just so happened that in this case, the medical team didn't think there was, you weren't quite ready to stop fighting and, and had some sort of sense that something else was going on. Um, you know, so this is, this is the rarest of cases. And we've said that before we, yes. we said that on the first podcast that we did general we're, we're not telling anybody not to follow medical advice in your Correctly. protocols whether it's dr keenan and dr gordon their teams uh, whomever generally that is the right thing to do so definitely do that this is just a really unusual case what what have the conversations been like between you two and and him when you've talked about that yeah i mean so even in the middle of like i started meds again all, after being told like we don't think this is going to turn out but we'll let you do this for a couple of days while we figure out what's going on and in that time we even had our follow-up with Dr. Keenan so we spoke to him on the phone and the whole conversation was centered around the third transfer like even for us <laughs> for Dr. Keenan like there was I felt like all I was doing really truly was honoring the life as long as I possibly could. But like, I have journal entries from that week or 10 days or whatever, going through the extra blood draws of like, Lord, give me the strength to love and lose this child. Give me the strength to um, like open up my hands and surrender their life. There was nothing, there was no talk of we would ever meet her earth side. <laughs> that was never, um, I mean, yeah, like it wasn't discussed really between you and I, I don't think Dr. Keenan, I mean, like I said, our whole conversation was just centered around like, well, what are we going to do differently for a third transfer? Yeah. I think we were all just holding our breath waiting for this pregnancy to truly end. I mean, nothing was indicating it was healthy. And I think Dr. Keenan was just, I don't know, maybe I should not put words in his mouth, but I feel like almost just letting, like doing a favor for me of like, okay, if you feel like you need to walk this out, you can walk it out, but we're going to have to monitor you very closely because like Perry said, if it didn't end up being ectopic or unhealthy, we needed to know that immediately. Um, yeah, in this case, it was medically safe for you to do that. Yes. That would not always be the case. And that is also very important to, uh, Correct. to point yes. out here. Well, Perry, what mm -hmm. was all this like for you? I mean, I, I you know, it's tough when you're the guy in these situations. I mean, I remember when, <laughs> you know, when my wife was pregnant quite a while ago now, but it's like, you're sort of the third party here trying to be supportive, not wanting to do or say the wrong things, but there's no script for this. Sure. Uh, you know, and, and it was such a, a uh, I don't remember the exact order of the dates and I wish we look back as far as, you know, when, when we went to, when we had talked to Dr. King, when we went to Preacher Rock to win, you know, we, you know, City left a lot of details out. I mean, you know, but we're sitting on 285 in Atlanta. For anyone who's listening who's ever been to Atlanta, <laughs> at, at, you know, 285 at 430 on a Friday afternoon is really not where you want to be, but we had somewhere we had to be um, uh, to go see some family. And and so when we got the call from Linda, it, it, you know, indicating that there, there was... And my like, numbers were still going yeah, up. Yeah, so, so that, that something was fighting um you know it's very much like all right we're in action mode you know it, it's like you know that was a friday so it's like well, we can't get to the doctor till monday to like no well is this is this something up the, up the tube that's 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 growing is this you know so you know what what what, what do we do all the same but at least we'll give it a fighting chance it's okay but once again under medical advice you know to at least try to sustain it wherever it is and then dress things accordingly we can get a scan on it come monday um and, and so you know very much jump into action mode we you know we... which i'm grateful for perry can jump into action mode much better than i can where i'm just like crying on the phone yeah. with linda and perry's like i'm gonna need the pharmacist information like we need to get yeah and it's like okay we're, we, we're this far away from this pharmacist they close at this time tell them to call into this pharmacist you know i'm calling the pharmacist like hey you should have just gotten this prescription it's like we haven't checked our voicemail yet we haven't checked go check right now like we are coming and we need this now. If it is not there, I saw a small window to call another pharmacy. So go check right now for me. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> um, and they had it and we we got there, got it spilled, you know, and you know, yeah. and, and so so yeah, so there's definitely a lot of, you know, yeah, it's you know, you mentioned third party. Yeah, I mean, wh where does the advocacy fall, you know, as it's 
you know, this is this is my wife you're talking about, you know, it's like this is her health, this is as well as like, well, this is my future child, like, you know, kind of balancing between, you know, advocating for both, you know, the, the health of, uh, of one and the other. Um, so yeah, it's that, yeah, I would, yeah, it's hard. It's hard. Um, you know, there it is. Uh, I'm always looking for kind of kind of something to do. So yeah, being <laughs> kind of, you know, what about plan, you know, what about plan X? Like we talked to A V, you know, A through, you know, W, like so what's you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a, it, it's a good posture, and that, that it, and it is a uh, it is also a tough posture to to be in when you're standing in you know sort of in between your wife and the various medical providers, and uh, sometimes you may have extended family start to get involved in telling you as the husband what you should tell the medical providers, and uh, yeah, I'm not saying that happened in your case, but uh, this is just a little bit of empathy for any guy who's in that situation. Yeah. Um, we've all been there, and it's a, it's a tough spot to be in. You don't want to yeah. overstep your ground when it comes to being too insistent with the medical provider, but yet at the same time, uh, you really risk the with the wrath of your wife and uh, potentially her family uh, if you don't do it. So those are tough spots that, that require wisdom. Uh, you definitely did the right thing there in being urgent with the, with the pharmacist. So so tell me, you two, how the rest of the pregnancy went from there. I think we talked um, on the first podcast episode, maybe when you were I don't know, maybe you were 15 or 16 weeks in somewhere around there. Maybe it wasn't quite that far along. But how did the rest of the pregnancy go? Yeah, I can't remember exactly how far along, but I I think if I remember correctly, we were when we had our last podcast, it was right before we were gonna have another ultrasound. Yeah. And I had told myself, okay, if we can just get to this ultrasound, then I'll finally be able to like take a deep breath and feel like this is a healthy pregnancy and everything's measuring on track and we're gonna be okay. And when we walked into that ultrasound, they found a cyst on the back of. Marley, that's our daughter's name, on the back of her neck. And we didn't know that she was a she at this point or, you know, we, had, we were very early on. Um, and I remember that our very, very kind OB looking at me and saying, she's like, I don't want you to panic, but it's a, it's an indication that something is abnormal. So we need to like do further testing. And I was like, what, it, like, what do you mean? Like abnormal, like a child with disabilities, a child that's going to be incompatible with life. Like I need, I need, I need answers. That's how I like feel like I process information. Um, and she was like, I don't know any of that yet, but it could be any of it. She's like, it could be fine. It could be nothing. It could be the worst case scenario. So she referred us to a specialist. And I remember walking out of that appointment being like devastated. And I just feel like you would have just so much hope through all of it. And I think you even said, you're like, I just don't feel like God would have I mean, we can't say that because we don't know God, but no. I think you just still felt very strongly that the Lord had plans beyond this for her. Um, and I really struggled seeing past that. So we got referred to a specialist. She was diagnosed with a cystic hygroma at the time. And, um, but everything else looked fine on her anatomy that they could see that early on. And so all of our genetic blood work came back good and yeah. clear. And so at that point, the specialist said, I, I think it, was, it wasn't though until, again, we're shortening a lot of this. This was weeks of yeah. a lot of anxiety. But I think by the time we were at 20 weeks, the specialist said, he's like, I think we're going to be in the clear here. So um, I could see it shrinking as she grew. And I was, you know, a good, good indicator that it never got bigger, that you know, proportionally the rest of her body size to her head, it, it continued to shrink. Yeah. Um, but it took away a lot of the joy of that yeah. first part of pregnancy. I mean, like, I come from how it started to like, okay. Yeah, I just felt like we never got yeah. good news about it. Like, <laughs> news about bad news. Yeah. Um, and I, I really, like, I didn't want to find out her gender. Like, I was very afraid because it just, it seemed like that was going to make it more real. But then there's this ongoing battle in my head of like, even if we lose her, she is still worth celebrating. Um, even if we lose her, God is still going to be good and sovereign in this somehow. So I just felt, I don't know, like we kind of had to muster the strength to move forward and celebrate her and cherish her for as long as we were given that opportunity to here on earth. And that 
was just kind of our posture with it. And so it really probably was not until around like 25 weeks of pregnancy that it was like, all right, well, now it's a normal pregnancy. And I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> like everything has been abnormal from, I mean, you know, like from infertility, like the way we got pregnant was, I don't, I mean, I wouldn't consider it abnormal, but it was not natural. And then nothing yeah. pregnancy had gone as expected. And so then by the time you're 25 weeks in and they're saying like, okay, well now it's healthy. I'm like, I, okay, <laughs> hold my breath from here on out. <laughs> this was a truly a uh, joyless pregnancy for the first, uh, like, half probably for 60 percent of it right i mean that's what yeah. it, it what a ride i mean most people don't have that experience it was mm -hmm. it, it was atypical uh no yes, doubt about sure. that <laughs> at least easily the last quarter of it that's when we find out she's you know her head is measuring like four weeks ahead from the yeah. rest of her body and it's like yeah she's gonna be a big baby so then the you know, induction conversations start happening. C-section is it? You know, do you try natural to only have to go to emergency C-section? So then it's like you know we're having those conversations the last three four weeks. That's true. It, all the same. Um, so there's maybe a, a sweet spot of eight weeks in there. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah growing, taking the bump pictures, going to showers. Yeah. You know. Um, oh. Yeah, kind of, kind of, you know, get last minute beach trip in before she gets, you know. Yeah. Uh, but it yeah. took a while to get there. With a really great outcome, and I don't want to, you know, and I think that's the other part, too, that I'm sure anybody who goes through infertility kind of experiences is that you feel, I had a lot of guilt ever complaining about being pregnant, right? Like, <laughs> I had a lot of guilt saying, this is hard, and this is rocky, you know, like this, um, that I'm uncomfortable or that like any of it or that I'm worried. And um, I think that you, I think we carry a weight of, we should just feel gratitude, like that that's it, but. But that's not real life. No, no. And it's not the way we were created to either, you know, like there's mourning and dancing and weeping and rejoicing. Like it all goes hand in hand and um, it's okay for every, it's okay for things to be both. And it's okay that we were really, really grateful that we were able to get pregnant and sustain the pregnancy like we did. And it was okay to say like, man, this has been really hard and full of a lot of anxiety. And, um, it was just a reminder over and over again of letting go and continuing to <laughs> trust God. <laughs> um, and we didn't know the outcome, you know, like, like I, I still feel like, I don't think there was ever a point where I really truly was able to say with 100% confidence, like, we will bring home a healthy child at the end of this. I think I was still afraid on the way to the hospital. <laughs> a lot about my personality, but yeah. I think it was just, it had felt like we were overcoming obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. So at some point, it was a self-defense mechanism, I guess, for me to just expect there to be another obstacle. Yeah, well, and that, and that completely makes sense. It was not an easy journey any of the way really so yeah. take me now the the thing is you did take home a healthy baby take me to the moment after all this when marley was born what was that like for each of you oh man so we did um end up doing a scheduled c-section uh which i think was just the call at the moment that was going to give us the most peace and she was nine and a half pounds so i feel okay that that was a, a good call that we made um and, you know, every, just remember, everybody I'm sure talked about this, those first two days in the hospital are just hard. There are people in and out. And as first time parents, we had absolutely zero idea what we're doing. Um, but I just remember, gosh, she was so perfect. Like, that's what I kept thinking. I was like, so I just didn't know what to expect. You know, <laughs> like I didn't know what that moment would be like. Um, and she was here and we, it was so sweet because we had the scheduled C-section. We were kind of able to plan for that in a way that most people weren't. And so I was able to have a playlist of worship music playing in the OR. Um, and so she literally came into the world with worship music playing around her. And that felt really special to me that we were able to do that. And um, it just, it felt I don't know, very surreal to me. And then she was just here and she was perfect. Like there was nothing 
We had a little bit of blood sugar issues in the hospital, but like there was no sign of a cyst on the back of her neck. There was no sign of anything being abnormal about her. I mean, she was just here and perfect and healthy and yeah. the absolute cutest baby in the world. <laughs> Barry? Yeah, I mean, just from, you know, getting to put the, you know, waking up at five o'clock in the morning and, and going to the hospital and it's like, we got everything. It's like, this, this is it. It's here. And it's like, are you ever really ready? And, you know, um, you know, getting to getting to put the scrubs on and then just, you know, kind of just wait until they call you in and, and just just knowing they're calling you in, you know, they're going to call you in right before it happens. And um, but yeah, and just kind of just being there, listening to the music, looking at her. And then it's, it's like you hear the cries. Like, OK, that's it. We've done it. And, you know, lift him up over the sheet and see you there and 10 fingers, 10 toes. And, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, get, get, getting to, you know, cut the cord and just, you know, I mean, I couldn't stop staring at her and, um, yeah, it was, it was just really surreal. And, uh, but yeah, the, the, the hospital, yeah, I don't, not that, you know, obviously everybody gets a lot of unsolicited pregnancy advice, you know, during, during, during pregnancy for better or for worse. And, um, uh, yeah, I, I wish people had, re I can't reiterate to, to new parents enough how, like I, I did not enjoy the two days in the hospital between other people coming in <laughs> and, and everything else. Like it was just, you know, the, she slept great. The baby, Marley slept great. You know, Marley, you know, Marley was easy during the hospital. It was, you know, um, it was just always something that felt like. And, um, but, uh, but yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a good day. Yes. It was a good. Mind you, I would say Perry slept pretty good too, because I do remember one night where I needed, I had a C-section, so I couldn't get up out of bed and I needed to wake the baby up to Peter. And I'm like throwing things at Perry across the room. <laughs> yeah, oh I'm God. so exhausted. <laughs> Probably the second night, the first night. Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it, it is. It's an exhausting position for, yeah. for both the two <laughs> yes. parents. So, yeah, I I totally get it. But by the way, if you're liking what you're hearing, don't forget to uh, give us a five star rating on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on or uh, smash the like button if you're listening on YouTube. Rate, review, subscribe to the Embryo Adoption Podcast. Uh, we'd appreciate that. That helps get the word out. So how has how is parenting, she's over a year old now, how has parenting been compared to what you expected? What has surprised you? Been way easier. Way easier. That is, sir. Yeah, I mean, she, she, she is in. She's coming into a a uh, uh, a challenging phase. You know, now that she is is mobile, she she knows where the pots and pans are. Um, you know, we, we got the. You know, she does not like the baby devices. Um, <laughs> yes, and, and so um, you know, sure, now, you know navigating the, the child care piece navigating some of those logistics where you know we've, thankfully our, our employers are you know they they're with us on our journey they understood they they knew you know when we said you know when we say hey yeah, by the way our doctors in knoxville we gotta you know thankfully we're down in the atlanta area we can come coming to the ndc is is a, is a logistical option for us and, and but it's like yeah by the way take the day off you're not where's your doctor not like, well it's a real special place let me tell you about <laughs> yeah so um, but yeah, I mean, she was, yeah, I don't know, I might be part of the but yeah. Girl, she she's just been well. a very easy baby. That sure, like, been a little sleep regression. Yes, she slept is. well from a young age. She has always been a great eater. Um, you know, so all of that has been, I think, a lot of those bigger stressors that most parents have as a young, but I mean, it has been harder adjusting. I, you know, I thought my identity had been shaped a lot through infertility and the Lord reminded me as soon as she was born, like, no, this is a, a constant process of sanctification. And so um, that has been very humbling for me, I think, in the parenting journey. Um, and I think we also carry I, I, this phrase that I have that I consider it's, it's a holy burden. Like she is a miracle. And so that's not a burden that I'm ungrateful to carry. But there is this burden that I feel like we, she has such a powerful story and I want it to be told and I want it to be told well. And I want, um, and where, you know, like, and where she came from, you know, like we've already tried having those conversations, but she's one, she doesn't really understand, but, um, 
we talk about how, you know, mommy and daddy had everything to make a baby for the love and the heart and the, you know, we wanted a baby, but we really struggled making the eyes and the ears and the nose. And, and I'm like, so that we have, and we use her biological parents' names and um, that they were able to help make. And so that's the way we're explaining it to her now as a one-year-old and that I'm sure will progress. But um, I think it's just too, I think that adds in an extra dynamic to parenting that yeah, we want to make start. sure that we're yeah, feeding I'm, that. I'm into, I'm into the donors are yeah, to, to her story, you know, that you know, adoption is not a not a taboo word. Um, you know, that that piece of, of it where she came from. Um and, and so you know, definitely trying to uh that that's something we've been passionate about from the start and they want to be open with her about from the start, like why we chose, you know, an open uh an open adoption. Um and so yeah, just starting to naturally incorporate that story so that it's not, you know. Oh well, wow. adopted. Yeah, it's not, it's not a shock one day. Yeah. Um, and so she continues to understand it. Um, real excited for her to get to you know middle school biology. Teachers are gonna love her. Um, you know, the, <laughs> given the science that you know you kind of really have to get to uh, uh, when you're it, going through infertility and um, you know getting down to that cellular level and uh, <laughs> it's great. All, all the shots and hormones and everything else. So. Should should be some interesting discussions then. How has it gone with the uh, with the donor family so far? So good, so good. We um, due to a lot of extenuating circumstances, we got our DNA results later than I think is typical. Again, you know, because just nothing is going to go typical with us. Um, and so once we knew for sure that when we truthfully had a pretty good idea which family she was from, because. Um, for those listening, we had transferred two embryos from two different donors. And the one obviously took from the Marley. Um, and we've just had a really great relationship with her biological family. We've done a lot of emails and sharing of like pictures and such. But just last week, we finally got to get on a Zoom call with them for the first time. And um, Marley was able to interact with them. And uh, we got to see their children. And it's just been, they have been so support I don't know great like I'm just yeah. so great grateful for them it's been a really great um relationship they've been very kind and very supportive and very open to whatever you know we want they're also very grateful for the level of openness that we're willing to have and um I it's been my biggest prayer I think that we continue to foster that relationship well but yeah it's gone really well yeah it's gone it's, you know, I guess everything we could ask for yeah talk about how you mentioned this just a second ago how infertility permanently shapes and changes you even though you've you've had a baby now it still changes you doesn't it yeah for sure um you know i think about my journey a lot as it relates to the israelites i know that sounds crazy i just feel like i can't ever get the wrong story without kind of comparing it to that and i felt like infertility was kind of like my time in captivity like in slavery like I think it was just there was this worldly thing we live in a fallen world and so something that God didn't intend for it to be but will not maybe ever be made whole on this side of heaven um that was upon us and it was dictating our steps and our life and um, it was putting boundaries on what we thought our future was going to look like and what we thought building a family was going to look like and um, really without any like clear answers we never had a yeah I never had a conclusive diagnosis yeah. as to why you know we weren't getting pregnant yeah all the numbers looked like it should be fine and it just wasn't happening for us um, but the Lord and his kindness had always kind of placed adoption on our hearts so I think we just never, um, we always thought that would be part of our story at some point. I think it was just, it was just never the way we expected. Never the way, I don't think, well, I for sure know that when we first started talking adoption, embryo adoption was not something we talked about because I'm not sure we knew it existed. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and we didn't know that we would not be able to have our own biological children, or at least not in the timing that we were expecting, right? I mean, I guess without a diagnosis, anything is up in the air, but for right now, it feels like that's it's not our story. And 
So I think it was an accepting of that. Um, but then truthfully, whenever we found embryo adoption, I felt like that was sort of like our journey to the wilderness, but we thought it was the journey to the promised land. Like, oh, this is going to get us like where we want to go. Um, and then it was just really opening up to a lot more. I mean, the law, I mean, there was loss of it, you know, yeah. just being, being, being so close actually, you know, it's one thing that the preparation for the, the transfers, the, 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 the home study, the, the shots, the medication, the, the, the cost in, you know, involved with, with that and, you know, the appointments, the appointments, the appointments. There's um, a whole other level of trust in the Lord that we had to walk through and a whole other um, just level of like self-identification, I think, too, in the sense of, okay, I, I you know, just like the Israelites kind of look back and like, why did you bring us out? In the Like, why did you bring us out here to die? You should have just left us as slaves in Egypt. Like, I felt that sometimes after a failed transfer, like, why not just let me never get pregnant? Like, take me back there. Like, this is this is harder. Yeah, well, first one we were so close, but then had to call it off at the last minute, and then the first transfer yeah, was canceled. First, yeah, first transfer Before, was canceled. Yeah. yeah, it's canceled. And then to then to walk through a transfer. And, yeah, then, then have to prep for another transfer. Walk through a transfer, lose two, and and then at that point, you know. Then the transfer was more relieved. We got there, yeah. yeah. Then, you know, <laughs> that we already yeah. discussed was hard and difficult. Um, and yeah. so I think too, yeah, I mean, it just continued to shape my identity in a way of uh, letting go of expectations for how I saw my future going and also realizing that at the end of it, God was going to be glorified no matter what, like good or bad, successful pregnancy or loss of pregnancy. The Lord is good and sovereign. And I know because that's really easy to say on this side that we were able to receive a miracle from it. But truthfully, on the way up that mountain, I looked at Perry and I said, how do you think we're supposed to be content in this circumstance? Like, how is, are we as Christians called to like find contentment in this? Because I don't want to ever be content with this. And we kind of talked about it. And I think we just settled on if we truly understand the weight of our own sin and what Jesus has already done on the cross for us, then everything else is favor. And it was a surrendering of that to say that I don't know what the outcome of this pregnancy is going to look like. But what I do know is I can look back and see how the Lord was there in infertility. And I can look back and see how his hand was on each of the other transfers. And I can look back and see how he had worked. And I think that was the only thing that allowed us to keep going. Yeah, just knowing that he is he is bigger and that we mm -hmm. don't understand it, just to have peace and trust in that yeah. and the big and the little things and just continue to kind of see that unfold with with Marley's life already. And but I do think infertility played a big part of that. I think it was how we walked through the difficult parts of our pregnancy is because we were able to look back and be like, well, do you remember when that really difficult thing we were walking through? Like the Lord had his hand in it. Um, I actually got emotional after a Zoom call with Marley's biological parents on Friday last week because it hit me. And I think I'd maybe like been able to put these dates in my head, but it just, it really wasn't until I heard them say it out loud that she was frozen in 2012. So before Perry and I ever even met, before I ever shed a tear to the Lord that I wasn't able to get pregnant, before I ever carried the guilt that I could not make my husband a father, before any of that, the Lord had gone before and formed and created her. And she was waiting for us. And that, I mean, I will just, that will never be lost on me before I ever cried out to the Lord in our pain and our hurt. He had already gone before and prepared a way. And it was just up to us. To surrender and find it um hard hard i mean like we've just got the obstacle after yeah. obstacle was not like it was just suddenly an easy miracle solution but um it is so comforting to know that when i at moments of my darkest of crying out to the lord and asking like why was he doing this to us that i can now go back and picture him saying like sydney just like only you knew hold on like if only you knew um and so, yeah, I think that, I don't know. There's not much more to say, I guess. <laughs> well, you, I, now you're making the point well. I mean, these are things that we can't 
fully understand. We won't fully understand this side of eternity. And sometimes you can't always put words to them, but it does help to talk about what it's like. And sometimes there's just not a silver bullet answer when you feel this way toward God or about how your life is going. And I think it's good to at least be honest about that. Well, yeah, of course, we keep in the back of our minds as believers that if we're Christ followers, he's using all of it in some way to fit us for glory. And so none of it's going to be wasted. Uh, but it's hard to feel that in the moment sometimes. And I think it's okay to to acknowledge that. Well, what would you, last thing, what would you two say to others who who feel the same? Um, maybe they're walking through infertility right now. Uh, maybe uh, their infertility days are over and they've they've had children. But um, I don't know, is, is going to this complicated place sometimes a, a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, I, I, I would say it, both in that i mean it's you know kind of i mean the, the israelite analogy is, is just really spot on um and and you know it's it's easy you know you could you can focus on the the time with the egyptians but then the same token you know you think even though they're wandering for 40 years they still have 40 years of uh of manna they still have 40 years of, of, of a cloud and and a pillar of fire by night and uh, just a I, I've, all, I've always been an optimist and and I guess I'm thankful for that through through this process, not to you know sort of being naive to 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 the risks, to the loss, to um, and everything that goes on, to the disappointment related to to fertility in general and embryo adoption for that matter. Um, but I guess it was just that that hope that just carried on. I know it sounds cliche, just to continue to have hope, to continue to fight, to continue to. To know that this, the story is not written and that we do just just you know take time to just sit and bask in the glory and the power um and the gentleness that comes with that power that that god does have his hand over us through this process and, and is leading to something and um if and how and when whatever might be glorified um that it will that it just it will it will happen and I think I would add too. you know, I feel like we had close friends look at us and say, like, I don't know how you guys have been able to like walk through it as well as you have. And to that, I would say it never felt like we were walking through it well. Like, I think every step, there's so many decisions that go into infertility and leading up to it. like all, all of it is so many more decisions than a normal person who is not struggling with infertility would have to make. Um, and to that, I would just say, I think every step we just tried to, what does it look like to be faithful in this decision? And we couldn't ever, I mean, I, I know I couldn't ever really see like the long term or like it was never this clear roadmap in our mind of, I don't know, that this is going to be it. It just felt like, okay, well, with where we are now, what is faithful with the next step? What does it look like to be faithful with the next step, with the next step, with the next step? And I think if you open your hands to that. And that is very easy to say and not easy to do. You know, like I was devastated when our transfer got canceled, right? Like when that, when that cycle got canceled and I remember thinking, you know, I try and like put a bandaid on it. Like, oh, well, at least, at least we didn't actually go through with a transfer and lose any lives. Like at least there was no loss of life. Like they called the transfer off, even though we were devastated for them. And then the next transfer came and we did lose lives. Like it, so it was just never, um, but it doesn't mean that we weren't being faithful along the way. And so I think that is like my biggest thing, just invite the Lord into every single step of the process and I don't know, I mean, trust that he's working it all out in some way bigger, you know, infinitely more than we can imagine and for his glory and our good, like all that is scriptural and um, it's hard. It's hard. We live in a fallen world and it's hard to see that on the side of heaven, but. I think that's the best advice I can have is just to invite him into every step of it. Yeah, I mean, it's a team effort between, you know, obviously, you know, between him and and us as uh, as our marriage, and you know, I mean, vocalizing when you know one of us may have felt alone in the process, or um, 
you know, you know, Mark, you mentioned, you know, appreciate you always bringing, bringing me in with some of the questions and, and recognizing how, yeah, this is the, the, the guy in this, we, we kind of have a, a weird role, you know, it, it's, you know, we may not, we're not, we're not the ones getting the blood draw, having to work around the logistics of, you know, I don't have to be there for the blood draw. I was, I, I was there for a lot of our initial fertility appointments before we got introduced to the NADC um, and, and, you know, thankful to have, you know, the ability to, to have been there for a lot of them, you know, and, um, but yeah, whether it's working on the home study, whether, you know, we, we all kind of had our, our roles accordingly, um, but it was still, you know, doing it together. Um, obviously a lot of the guys out there were the ones giving the shots and that's, it's always a, yep. you know, you gotta have a little humor with it. I feel like at some points, but it's, it's still, it is hard when you see the bruises start to come and you see the, you know, the pile of needles and, and it's, you know, what, what is this for again? Like, what, what are we doing? Does this ever end? Like, uh, yeah. And here she is mm -hmm. one year old and amazing. Yeah. God has been, has, has been good. And I, I love it. I think, um, you know, one thing I've heard my pastor say is, uh, you, you do the next healthy thing when you're sort of in a fog, right? You do the next healthy thing and you trust God and uh, that he, he he obviously is superintending it. His power will be with you. And I like what you said, Perry, that you'll also feel the gentleness. No matter how hard it is, he'll give you that sense of his his gentleness and his kindness. Uh sometimes, sometimes in a bigger way than others throughout the process. It's a it's a wonderful story, and we're we're so thankful for you two coming back to share the rest of it. And thank you for Marley, your little miracle. This has been the Embryo Adoption Podcast. I'm Mark Mellinger. If you want to find out more about the NEDC, go ahead and look us up, embryodonation.org, embryodonation.org. And again, if you like the content, go ahead and rate, review, subscribe on whatever platform you happen to be listening to. Thanks for joining us.